will ask that you'll stand together with me, please, as we look into God's Word together, very briefly. This morning we're reading from Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and, the death, and, the, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found in the, written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Let's pray together, please. Lord Jesus, now as we come to this time of our service, I ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say to us. Lord, uh, you know my heart, and you know that uh, this, this is going to be a tough lesson in the sense that it's, uh, it's not always easy to talk about these things, but I pray that uh, you would give me wisdom in what I have to share, and I pray that you would uh, give us uh, understanding as we look into your word. Help us to uh, go from this place encouraged by what you have for us, and uh, I pray that the meditation in my mouth, and, or the meditation in my heart, and the words of my mouth would be pleasing and satisfying to you, and I pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This morning, uh, before we get into our actual lesson, uh, just uh, share a little bit about what we're going to be doing here as we come into the Advent season. Uh, we'll be starting next week a series called When, the, when You Least Expect It, God Shows Up. And uh, so we'll be kind of talking about that over the Advent season. We're using uh, some of the Christmas story, quite frankly, some other examples of the fact that there's a lot of times God shows up in our lives and we don't notice it. You know, if you think about it, there were really, when Jesus came the first time, there were really only just a few people that acknowledged or saw that what was happening. And even among them, they didn't fully understand all that that meant. You can't tell me for a minute that the shepherds going to the, the manger that, that night knew exactly what it meant, even though they'd seen uh, the angels and been told by the angels. Um, and I think there's a lot of times in our own lives when God is doing things in our lives and we don't really see it, we don't really uh, pay attention to it. Um, I think sometimes I drive my, my lovely bride nuts, well I know I drive my lovely bride nuts, but there's times when I'll say, you didn't mean to not quite so. <laughs> there's there's times where I'll come home and I'll say, you know, it's really, really cool. This happened today. And, and maybe it's not a huge thing, but, but God just shows up and does stuff. You know, it can be, to me, it's you know, just maybe simple things like, you know, um, being late somewhere and being able to get onto the highway without heavy traffic. Or, you, know, you know, God does little things in our lives that really are big things. And so, through the Advent season, what I want us to be focusing on is this very fact that when we least expect it, God can show up. And then the second part of that is, are we ready to acknowledge that? Are we ready to really see what that means? So that will be coming up. This morning we finish our series called I'm Coming Back. And we talk about what is probably one of the most difficult um, things for us to talk about. Uh, have, if you've ever been in a situation, it could have been a staff meeting at work, or it could have been in a classroom, or it could have been within the family, and there's some underlying problem. And everybody in the room knows about that problem, but nobody wants to talk about it. And you know, we refer to that as the elephant in the room, you know, and uh, the one thing nobody ever wants to talk about, but it needs to be talked about, but you don't want to be the one to do it, because you know what happens is, if it's a situation that's very touchy, very sensitive, and you're the one that brings it up, who's the troublemaker? You are. Even though everybody else agrees with you, they've got a scapegoat now, and it's you, you know. Um, this morning we're going to talk about something that is kind of like an elephant in the room, and that's death. We don't like to think about death. Um, the reason being that, first of all, we don't exactly know what's going to happen with that. Thankfully, because of our faith in Christ, uh, we can know what's going to happen, where we're going, but we don't know everything that's going to be involved in that. So this morning is sort of, as we close out our time, is 
Um, sort of a heavy lesson for me, I'll, I'll be honest with you, that, but the good news on everything that I'm going to say now is one underlying fact, and that's the fact that if you have Jesus Christ in your heart as your personal Lord and Savior, you don't need to worry about a lot of the things we're going to talk about this morning. So that's the good news. The bad news is what I'm hoping to do as a result of this is two things. First of all, encouraging us to make sure we know our destiny. And the second thing is to, remember, to realize the fact that we have a responsibility to those around us to help us help them not be caught up in the scenario of what we're going to talk about today. Most Americans don't like to talk about death, yet three-fourths of Americans believe that there's a heaven or a hell. Sixty-six percent believe in heaven and hell, and 82 percent believe that they will be in heaven. 82%. Now think about 82% of the people that you know. 82 out of every 100 people you know think they're going to go to heaven. I know a few people in my life that probably think they're going to go to heaven, and I'm just a little bit concerned, because I don't think they will. And it's not my place, but I think what we need to realize is, and, and I've always felt this, and I know I've shared this with you, is there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be surprised when the time comes, because they were going to be just sure that they were going, but they had they had some wrong information. 82%. There are 2% of the people, and this is all from a recent ABC poll, uh, there are 2% of the people that believe they will be in hell. They know they're going to go there, and that's fine with them. And you've heard those arguments, maybe, of, well, and I know I'm going to hell. You know what? All my friends will be there. So it'll be all right, you know. Well, I'm hoping all my friends aren't there, first of all. And secondly, it's not going to be all right. But that's one of those topics that we need to talk about. That's one of those topics that we don't like to talk about, but it needs to be addressed. One of the reasons we don't like to talk about death, like I said earlier, is because we don't, uh, we don't know what's going to happen with it. And the other reason is because right now we're so busy with life. We're so busy trying to figure out how to get through each day. You know, sometimes... Uh, you know, kind of like what uh, Linda, a.k.a. Sue, apparently, uh, what Linda talked about earlier about being a tough week. You know, how do you focus on, on your, your own eternity when you're trying to help somebody else, you know, stay out of their own eternity? How do you, how do you deal with life situations and the struggles that come up? Or how do you deal with it when you see other people that are struggling and you just want to, you know, sometimes you want to grab them and just you know, pull them back under the right path. Other times you want to just slap them because you know they're making all kinds of bad choices. And it's tough. Uh, so we get so caught up in all of that that we don't, you know, think about it. I think another reason uh, some people don't like to think about death is because, um, or I should say they don't like to, they don't think much about death, is because it's a lot easier to think about, um, we get apathetic towards it. And I think sometimes we as Christians, or let me rephrase that, not we as Christians, but we people that are um, God-conscious um, don't think so much about it because it's just, we get apathetic. And it's, if you have a dying, go to heaven, so we don't think anything more about it. And I don't think any of those things are really the, the healthiest way for us to look at The passage that we read this morning talks about the great white throne of judgment. And, and like I say, my goal, my prayer... My desire is that none of you are there. Uh, I know I won't be there. At least my understanding of the scriptures, I won't be there. But what, what we see happening in Revelation chapter 20 is really two events happening. If you think about last week, we talked about the millennium. The week before that, we talked about um, the judgment seat of Christ. And so we have, to, we have a dichotomy, really, because what happens is after the rapture, which we, we talked about that time, when we as believers in Christ will be elevated up into heaven, and we will, we will meet Jesus in the clouds, and we'll go into heaven, there will be the, the judgment seat of Christ on which we're, we're judged, and I say judged uh, lightly, we're judged on the basis of what we have done for Christ, and we are allowed, we are given rewards for that. And in the meantime, the world is going through tribulation, and then Jesus comes back, and we have the, the millennium. Um, then the second event happens. So on one side, we have the, uh, us as believers that are in heaven being rewarded for our time with Jesus. The second event that's going on, then, is the great white throne of judgment, and, and that's what John talks about here in, in uh, Revelation 19, 7, 
Well, Revelation 19, 7 talks about the marriage seat peace of Christ. It says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Uh, you know, that, that whole picture of the church being presented to Jesus as his bride. You know, I, I think of, uh, you know, the weddings that I have been able to do. And one of the cool things I love about doing weddings is the fact that I get to stand up here and, and in most of the weddings that I've done, it's, it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of traditions and weddings that have gotten away. You know, um, but there's some that have stayed amazingly the same. And one of them is the groom, not or the bride. Or the, they they agree to the fact that the groom will not see the bride in her wedding gown until the time she walks down that aisle. Which means me, as the pastor, gets to be the second one that gets to see this beautiful woman coming down the aisle in that gown, and it's so cool to watch the husband or the, the groom. Because he looks back and he sees that beautiful woman come, coming down the aisle and he just beams. He just beams. You know? And I don't know what he's thinking. I know what I was thinking when I saw my bride coming down the aisle. I was like, how did I get to be so lucky to have this woman in my life? You know? Actually, I had one wedding that I performed a couple years ago where the, the groom turned and he watched her come down and he broke into tears. Not just, you know, kind of misty-eyed. He broke into a full fled ball. He took his handkerchief out of his tuxedo and he just buried his face in it. And as I talked to the bride later, she said, I didn't know what to do. She said, I didn't want to cry because my makeup would run and I didn't want to cry anyway. She said, I'm walking on the aisle and I look up at Brian. He's bawling his head off. So I can't look at him. And I look over at my mom and she's crying. So I can't look at her. So I look over at dad. He's crying. But everybody was so happy watch this beautiful woman come down the aisle. That's what it's going to be like for us as the church. For the wedding feast of Christ. Jesus is going to see us and regardless of all the struggles we've got here on earth, all the times that we have failed him, all of that is in the past now. He's going to see us and it's just going to be, wow. What a cool thing. So that's that whole wedding feast of Christ. Like I said, the other part is the other side of the coin. It's almost the exact opposite extreme. Then I saw a great white throne, and he who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled away from his presence, and there was no place for him. First of all, the great white throne is symbolic in the sense of the fact that it's great, meaning power, it's white, talks about purity, it's a, a throne, so it talks about authority. So this is the final authority. And it says, I saw the dead great and small standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was open, which is the book of life. So there were two events, the marriage feast of uh, Christ, and then there were, there's the great white throne. And uh, verse uh, 12 talks about that. I saw the dead, and great, the, the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done in the, as recorded in the books. Two sets, two events. One event is the marriage feast of Christ, where Jesus welcomes us as his bride. The other event, where Jesus sits on the throne. It's interesting, uh, you know, God the Father is the ultimate authority through all of this, but when it comes to this point of judging the world, he allows, <coughs> uh, gives that authority to Jesus. And so Jesus is judging. So on one side, he's rejoicing, and we're rejoicing with him. On the other side, he is judging, and those that are involved in that judgment are in fear. Je uh, Revelation, uh, I'm going to just read these next couple of verses, but 23, uh, 20, 13, and 14 says, The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death as Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they've been done. The death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. So what, what that really is saying is that, you know, one part of it is that earth and heaven were taken away. What we don't understand about the great white throne of judgment is where it happens. Apparently it happens somewhere in outer space because if you remember during the tribulation period, the earth was decimated. During the millennial period, it was restored for that thousand year reign of Christ. And during that time, there were, there were babies born, there were children that grew up that had the same choices 
as we have now as to whether we follow Christ or not. So a lot of the people that we will see at the Great White Throne of Judgment, well, a lot of people that will be seen, I won't see them. Hopefully you won't. Are people that were born in the millennium period that still have that choice as to whether they're going to make it or not. In fact, after the millennium, if you backed up uh, to another, a few verses in Revelation 20, it would say that after that thousand year period, Satan is released one last time to try to deceive the nations. And there will people, be people that will follow him, but that rebellion will be put down. And that's when the great white throne happens. And then, earth and heaven, as we know it, will be completely destroyed. And as, if we were had time to go to Revelation 21, we know the reason those two were completely destroyed is that's when the new heaven comes in, the new earth. And like I mentioned before, the, you know, if I can call it that, the, the new garden of Eden, where everything will be perfect, where there won't be any need for a sun because the light of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will light us. There won't be any need for, for uh, hospitals or doctors or nurses because there will be no illness. There will be no sin. There will be no struggle. I can't wait. I don't know about you, but I can't wait. So we see that there's two events. There's two books that are being opened up, or should I say two sets of books. It says books, and it doesn't describe those, and then it says the book of life. And the book of life, uh, the books rather, talk about all the things that people have done. All of their deeds, good and bad. The book of life talks about what they haven't done. In other words, the book of life talks about or the book that of uh, the book, other books, uh, talk about all the good things that you've done. You went to church all the time, you took good care of your family, you had a good job, you did this, you did that, you didn't murder anybody, uh, you didn't commit adultery, you didn't do all of these things. You did all this good stuff. And he's going to open up those books and he's going to look at all the things that you did. The other book is the book of life. This book doesn't talk about what you did. Uh, as far as activities, this talks about what you did with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the only person, the only people that have accepted, only people that have accepted Christ as their Savior will be in the book of life. So what's going to happen for the unbeliever is they're going to come before this great white throne and God is going to say, okay, you know, George, I'm looking at the book and I see that you were a good church attender. You were even a pastor for a while. And you were this and you were that. Now I'm looking in the book of life I don't see your name over here, George. I don't see that you've accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. So even though there's all this good, since you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, I can't lift you to heaven. For George, we'll end up going to hell. Now the bad, the good, that's the bad news. There's not a lot of good news to that. The good news to that is the Bible does talk about the fact that there imply that there's levels in hell as to how somebody will be punished. Those people that are complete, that Satan will be, and his demons will be punished the worst. Um, and it will go on from there. But even at the very best, those people that have, don't have their name in the book of life, that have never made that, that decision for Jesus Christ, will then not have hell. And we don't like to think about hell. In fact, we like to think mostly about you know, all of the good things in life. But it doesn't happen that way. So there's two types of people. Revelation 20.15 talks about anyone whose name not found in the book of life was thrown into the, the lake of fire. Like I just got done talking about. Revelation 21, 7 says, those who are victorious will inherit all of this, talking about heaven, the new heaven, the new order. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. So the great white throne talks about two different events, or this particular part of scripture talks about two different events. The event of the Lord's, uh, the marriage feast of Christ, and the great white throne. It talks about two different types of books. The books about our actions and the book of life. One gets us into heaven, one does not. And it talks about two types of people. Those who will be damned for eternity and those who will live for eternity with Christ. There's three things that each of us are guaranteed of. One is that everybody lives. And an interesting thing is in the Bible, in the Greek languages, there's three words for the word lives. Now we think of lives and we think of just one thing, but there's three different words for it. For that, that I just want to go over briefly. One is this, the one Greek word for lives that's translated lives is the word bios or bios, and that is uh, the word we get biology from. It talks about our physical life and the fact that God has given us our physical life to grow into, to, um, you know, the, to this is my bios. You know, it's not much, but it's what I got. There's another word for lives, which is the word suke, 
And the suke, come, the, uh, we get the word psychology from suke, so that word suke talks about the part of our lives that's our emotions, our heart, our mind, and all those things. And in Matthew chapter 26, 25, 16, 25, where this verse is, uh, where this word is used, it says, For whoever wants to save their life, their mind, their emotions, their, their, uh, their psych- psychosis, whether the mind and the will, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. You know, what Jesus is saying there is, if you turn all of your thoughts, all of your emotions, all of your desires over to me, you'll find life. If you try to keep them for yourself, then you're just going to come into frustration. You're just going to come into to anger, to, to hardship, to death, you know, uh, eternal death. The third word is the word zoe. And that talks about eternal life, the divine life, the soul of us. That lives forever. You know, one of the things that when I grew up, um, uh, I was told that, you know, if you accept Jesus as your Savior, you'll have eternal life. And that part's true, but there's something that we don't realize about that, and, and that is that, you know, we think that everybody dies, but in a sense, everybody lives forever. The human soul is created such that it's, it's, a, it's an eternal thing inside of us. So those people that have never accepted Christ will live forever as well. But they live separated from God. Everybody lives. Everybody dies. Listen to what Hebrews 9.27 says. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that they face the judgment. So in death, there's no status. We all die. And once we die, it doesn't matter if we were a lawyer in real life, or a doctor, or a president, or whatever we were in real life, it doesn't matter, because once we're dead, we're all the same. What really matters after death is what we've done. And that's the other part of it, because everybody rises, everybody lives, everybody dies, but everybody will rise again, either to eternity with Christ or eternity in hell. Listen to what John 5, 28 through 30 says. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Then Jesus says something kind of interesting. He says, by myself I can do nothing. That's what Jesus says. By myself I can do nothing. I only judge as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Even Jesus says, if you come before me and plead your case, I can't do anything about it. Because God the Father makes that determination. And how he does it is, is your name in the book of life? So what I want to leave us with this morning is a question. Everyone lives, everybody dies, everybody rises. What I want to ask you is this question. Where will you be at the great white throne? It's a choice that you have to make. And if you've been with us throughout this series, you might be getting a little frustrated with me right now in the sense that I've asked this question a lot over the weeks. But let me tell you why I've asked this question so much over the last several weeks together. There's a sense, and you know me well enough to know I don't buy into this whole pastoral authority thing. If you call me father, I'll... Probably. Well, the only one I've got to get by with that is Gwen. She does it once in a while. But the reason I have emphasized this so much over the last few weeks is I feel responsible for you. I feel responsible for you. When, when we die, how, when we get ushered into glory, whether it be through the rapture or through death or whatever, I want to see each and every one of you here. I want to see each and every one of you there. Just like you as parents, as you, you, you have your kids and you raise them up and you want to see them succeed and you want to see them do certain things, I want to see you in heaven. And if my understanding of Scripture is true, the only way that will happen is if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, then I want to be sure that that happens. So, where will we be at the great white throne? I'm not going to be there. And I'm hoping and praying that you won't be either. See, here's the thing. There's going to be a lot of people, and I mentioned this earlier, there's going to be a lot of people that think they're going to heaven. Let me tell you something rather shocking. There will be no Lutherans in heaven. Not a single Lutheran. 
There will be no assembly of God people in heaven. Or Baptist people in heaven. Or Methodist people in heaven. Or Catholic people in heaven. Or Reformed people in heaven. The only people that will be in heaven is followers of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of people in a lot of different denominations that rely on their baptism, or they rely on their confirmation, or they rely on their church attendance, or the amount of money that they write out to the church, and they rely on all of these things for their eternal destiny, and when they come before the great white throne, God is going to say, if your name ain't here, you're not coming in here. And that's not the way he wants it. He didn't create hell for people. You know, some people say, well, if God created, if God is so good, this is one of the arguments I've heard, if God is so good, then why did he create hell? I'll tell you from scripture why we think God created hell. God created hell because Satan, when God created the heavens and the earth, he said everything was what? Good. But then Satan rebelled. And when Satan rebelled and he took a bunch of demons with him and, and deceived God's people and caused them to sin, and all of a sudden God realized that he could not allow that to happen. So he created hell for Satan and for his demons. God has no desire, has never had any desire for us to be there. That's for Satan and his cohorts. Heaven is for us. There will be no Lutherans, there will be no Baptists. Where will you be? I know where I'll be, and I hope that each of you can say in your heart of hearts, you know what, I know where I'll be. So then the second part of that question is this. What are we doing, what are you doing individually to make sure that the people you know in your circles, your family members, your co-workers, your friends, are going to be there with you. There's a video that I really wanted to show, and it was way too long to, uh, to show to us, but it was a, 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 a obviously fictitious letter written by a young man who had a friend that was a believer. And the two of them were at a party, and, and on the way home, uh, they were both drunk. Well, the believer wasn't drunk, but the unbeliever was drunk. They got in a car accident. The unbeliever was killed. And after the funeral... The, guy, the kid that was a believer got a letter from his best friend from hell. And I wish I could show it because it was very, you know, if you want to look for it, go to YouTube and type in a letter from hell. Basically what I was saying is, why didn't you tell me? You know, you said a couple times you were a Christian, but when I asked you, when I asked you how I could be a Christian, you changed the subject. And now I can hear that coming down the hall for me. I smell the sulfur. I smell the heat. Why didn't you tell me? Then it was signed, kind of weird, it was signed, P.S. Wish you were here. <laughs> a doctor um, was, um, has seen many people die, wrote a book. He had done a study because he didn't believe in life after death. But then he started watching and realizing that there is life after death. He, he could see it happen with people that he uh, would be working on or whatever. And, and we like to think of the story, some of you may have heard the story, um, Heaven is for Real. The story about the little boy that was in a car accident and he's laying on the operating table and his dad is in one room to came to with God, his mom is off in another room crying, and after the little boy comes back miraculously, he, he tells his mom and dad all kinds of things about heaven and all kinds of things that he saw through all this. Now, it's really cool, isn't it cool reading those stories? Another one is called 90 Minutes in Heaven, about a guy that was in heaven for 90 minutes and came back. Nobody ever writes about the books, and this is what the, 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 the document of this book says, nobody ever writes about the other stuff. The stuff he's seen where people have, have died and come back and said, all I can feel is darkness and coldness. All I can feel is despair and frustration. I saw this light at the end, but as I got closer, it, it got more and more dim. and I, it, 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 it disappeared and I felt this, this huge weight. 
We like to think about heaven. And most of, us, most of the people out there think they're going there, but we don't think enough about hell. This morning, I'd like you to stand together as we, we close this morning. Let's stand together. Now I'm going to ask uh, each of us to bow our heads and, and just to close our eyes just for a few moments before God. And as I've asked over the last few weeks, I'm going to ask again. And I'm not apologizing for it. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you have not made that decision, you can't tell me this morning. You can't look at me in the eye and say, yes, Pastor Mike, I know I'm going to heaven. I know I've made that decision for Christ. If you can't do that, please do it this morning. Please do it this morning. Not for me, not for God, but for you. Is there anybody here that's really doubting that? Would you just look up at me, please? Anybody? Praise the Lord. We're all going. Second thing I want to ask you is this. I want you to think just for one moment of one person that you will, you will commit to praying for for the next couple of weeks, just a couple of weeks, that you'll have opportunity to share Jesus with them, realizing you may be their last hope. Would you do that, please? Father God, we come to the end of this and such a, a heavy lesson. Um, despair for those that we know that are heading down the wrong path and, and praise for us because we know that we're going to see you face to face. I pray for us. I, I pray that you would help us, especially during this Thanksgiving and Advent season, to just be continually reminded of all the many blessings you've given us and to continue to praise you for that. But at the same time, help us to be seeking ways in which we can share the love and the grace and the forgiveness of you so that the people that we know will not endure eternity without you because eternity is a long, long time to be without you. And I pray these things in your righteous and holy name. Amen. Now to him who is able to his plan through his power and each of our lives, to him who is able to do far above and beyond all that we could ask or imagine, to him be all the praise and all the honor, the glory, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.